Let's pray. <laughs> Gracious God, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for bringing us together once again to share your word. Be with us. Bless us. That we might know you more fully. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're, we're looking at um, the last two and a half chapters of John. Um, and I, I'm, I'm kind of scrunching in the end because this is the last Sunday before Lent, and um, it just seemed appropriate to me that we start something, uh, or that Pastor Josh starts something fresh for the season of Lent, and we can finish up all this. Uh, to answer uh, uh, Josh's question, who would you like to have a conversation with? I'm going to give you the opportunity to say that because maybe you were bashful in there. Anybody? I was going to say God, and I would have been, I would have been terrible. I would have taken either. God? Yeah, you would have stolen his thunder. Way to go. <laughs> That's, yeah. Anybody? I'm sorry? Martin Luther. Martin Luther? My grade school teacher for seven years. Your, My grade school teacher. Your grade school teacher. Seven years. And, and seven years, wow. Yeah. Your dad. My dad, yeah. She never got to meet my dad. Uh, my grandparents on my dad's side. Never got to meet them. Mm -hmm. and your parents? Well, you guys are all better than me. I, I uh, Now that you mention my dad, yeah. <laughs> well, that'd be great. Uh, mine was Stan Usual. <laughs> you know, do, do you know who Stan Musial was? The sports. Yeah, he's, he's probably the greatest all-time player for the St. Louis Cardinals, and, and I actually did get to meet him and uh, uh, at a banquet in St. Louis. Uh, strangely enough, it was a scholar-athlete banquet, and I got to represent our high school. Yeah, me a scholar, me an athlete. I know that's surprising. But I got to shake Stan's hand, and uh, long before you wash it. yeah, didn't wash it for a couple of weeks. I don't know. We were going together at the time. Now, did I let you touch that hand? I don't believe so. <laughs> yeah, it's it's interesting that the people that that we encountered. At first, I thought Abraham Lincoln. That would have been an interesting mm -hmm. conversation. And Josh said C.S. Lewis. That would have been interesting as well. There's there are all kinds of interesting people out there that we would have. Uh, it would have been interesting to talk, sit down and talk to Jesus. Uh, I might have felt a little intimidated because he had been saying, here's where you messed up in your ministry. You should have done this and you should have done that. Yeah, okay. You know, or, or maybe even St. Paul or St. Peter, any of the disciples, you know, except Judas. All right, well, this is why we run late. <laughs> we are at uh, John chapter 19, and we are starting at verse 17, because we went through uh, 16 last week. They had taken Jesus out to be crucified, verse 17. And he went out, bearing his own cross, to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Well, let's pause there. Uh, there's just a, a few things, and maybe you, you're already aware of this, but interesting, he went out bearing his own cross. We always know Jesus uh, bore his own cross. He did not, as so many movies, um, depict didn't 
he didn't carry the full cross. He probably just carried the cross beam. That the, the pole was already out at Golgotha. It was already there. And, and that would have been a more logical way of, of doing it. So um, went to the place of the skull. Um, if you go to uh, Israel today, to Jerusalem, you can, you can see uh, the, the place of the skull. It, and it looks like a skull on one side and the Jerusalem bus garage on the other. <laughs> so it, you, you've got to focus on what you're looking at because you've you got all these idling buses and it just kind of takes away from the thing. But, uh, and there they crucified him, one on either side. And, and uh, Pilate writes that inscription in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. Aramaic was the common language for the people. Latin was the official language uh, of the Roman Empire. And Greek was the business language. That's what the, the uh, shopkeepers and all that, uh, they would more likely do business in Greek. So you have three languages on the cross so that everybody would know uh, that this was the king of the Jews. Um, so it's a um, kind of an interesting way of, of how they, they put that. Verse 23. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom, so they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby. He said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her to his <coughs> home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. One of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. Why would they have to break the legs? Uh, so they couldn't breathe. So you're on the cross, and you're stretched out like this, and you've got a little uh, table or uh, with your feet on it. And, and you sag, well, you can't breathe now. You push up, I can't get a breath. Okay. Now, when you break my legs, I can't push up. So it was a, a, a torturous, torturous way of doing things. Uh, in crucifixion, the, the, it was considered to be the, the, the worst um, punishment, the worst form of death in those days. It was only reserved for the criminals. Which makes it all the more uh, infuriating that our Lord would have had to be crucified. Yeah, part of the of God's plan of salvation for you and me. Uh, crucifixion, they would put uh, a spike, a nail, probably through the wrist 
we always picture it as the hands. But if you have the hands, like right here, the weight is going to tear through the hands. So you put it in here between the tendons and stuff, you got a good firm, holds it very nicely. <laughs> you know, it's just kind of like, oh, the Romans were experts at crucifixion. We shouldn't forget that. They knew exactly how to crucify, how to be efficient about it, and, and all of that sort of thing. So, um, and an, an intriguing thing. So they come along. They break the, the legs. The guy can't breathe anymore and he suffocates. Jesus is already dead. So his bones will not be broken. Again, fulfilling scripture. Okay. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. All right, now let's take a look at the, at the questions. <clears throat> Question one, John simply says that they crucified him. So much in the word. Crucifixion involved incredible amounts of pain, headaches from blood rushes, swelling of wounds, severe breathing troubles, etc. Yet this was only the beginning of Jesus' suffering. What might we miss if we simply dwelt on the physical horror of Jesus' crucifixion? And it was bad, and, and there have been there have books and, and papers have been written on the physical um, physicality of crucifixion. But what else, what could we miss if all we thought about was the physical? What else did Jesus go through? Mental anguish. Mental anguish. Mm -hmm. His mother watching him die. His mother watching him die. That, that'd be a horrible thing for her. John doesn't record it. Uh, and I forget which gospel writer does. I think Luke. Where Jesus says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He's going through a spiritual anguish as well. He's bearing the sins of the entire world. And this is really, you know, we, we always kind of get caught up in the physical part of crucifixion. But here he was um, spiritually, mentally, emotionally going through all this, this horrible stuff. Um, and, and you moms just stand and watch your son be crucified the anguish Mary went through. Oh my goodness. Uh, incredible. Okay. Uh, so. Who was, who was the man that he said take care of his mother? Who is that? John. Good question. Who was that? John. John. John, John in his gospel, um, I, I cannot think of a place where he ever identifies himself. He always says, uh, the one who whom Jesus loved, or the one, the, the man he loved. And the same here. He, he just speaks to, because John was kind of already taking care of Mary during this critical time. So, yeah. Okay. Question two. How many prophecies does John record as being fulfilled at Jesus' uh, crucifixion? Um, and I'm going to tell you that because we have to go back through all of that. Uh, the soldiers divided up his clothing. That's verse 24. Jesus said, I thirst. Verse 28. Jesus' legs were not broken. Verse 36. And his side was pierced. Verse 37. So, four prophecies that uh, spoke of uh, those four things. What was the last one? Uh, 
that uh, his side was pierced. Verse, Verse 37. Number three, what did Jesus mean when he said, it is finished? is complete. It's done. The, uh, the Greek word for it is finished is tetelestai. Tetelestai means paid in full. The merchants would use that. When you bought something, they'd give you a receipt. They, I don't know if they had stamps back in those days. <laughs> but they would stamp it tetelestai. And that's exactly what Jesus said. Tetelestai. It's paid in full. There's nothing left to be done. It's, it's all finished. It's, a, it's maybe the, in the English translation, it's the three greatest words of the Bible. It is finished. Wow. That's a fantastic thing. Uh, number four, how had Nicodemus grown in faith? <laughs> and, and Joseph of Arimathea as well. How had they both grown in faith? When did they come to Jesus? By night. By night. Nicodemus by night. Because, you know, you don't want to do stuff where people can see you. Um, and it says uh, that uh, Joseph followed Jesus secretly for fear of the Jews. Now they come out publicly. I want the body of, of Jesus. I mean, he goes to Pilate and asks for it. Joseph does. And Nicodemus is bringing 75 pounds of spices. Now, you know, it's kind of like uh, uh, they said about uh, Lazarus when Jesus wanted to go see Lazarus. And, and uh, you know, Lord, by this time he stinketh. That's King James. The body is decaying. It is not a pleasant odor. Um, if you've ever come across an animal that has been dead for a while and is decaying, oh, it's a terrible smell. I can only imagine what a human body uh, smells like. Um, so 75 pounds of uh, uh, spices, myrrh and aloes and, and those things, to, to anoint the body. And this was the custom of the Jews. Uh, uh, to bury, and you know, today we embalm, and and there's a similar uh, uh, thing there, taking out the fluids and putting in uh, fluid to preserve, uh, unless cremation is taking place. But uh, yeah, so Nicodemus he, he brings 75 pounds of in weight. Oh my goodness, I don't know that he carried all that. He might have had, uh, you know, he had servants or whatever. So. Okay, and then the, in the place uh, there was a garden, a garden, a new tomb, which no one had been laid. Um, so they put Jesus there, um, Joseph's tomb, and and it, uh, you know, you go, a new tomb, nobody had been laid. That's kind of like, well, that's what we think of today, you know, if there's a burial plot. They dig a, a hole. There's nobody has used this, but those tombs were different. They were carved out of rock, and you know, maybe it was used once before. And they took the bones, and you know, after everything, and they shoved them off to the side or something. I don't know. Um, but this one was brand new, and they, they put Jesus in this brand new, uh, brand new tomb. So, okay. Any any thoughts on that? Uh, portion of chapter uh, 19. Okay. Chapter 20. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. 
So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple. See? That's John. The other disciple. Because he's not going to say, yeah, he came, she came to me too. He's being very uh, humble here. Uh, the one whom Jesus loved. That's how John de defines himself. Not that Jesus didn't love the other disciples, but this is John's gospel. <laughs> he gets to write what he wants. And we do not know, let's see, where... Um, so she ran and, and, the one, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He's a younger man, and he, he sprints. He wants to know what's going on. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloth lying there, but he did not go in. Some commentators have suggested that uh, John was associated with a priestly class, and he knew the the uh, well. Peter would know too the, the obstacles or the problems of touching a dead body. It had been unclean, so he just couldn't look in there and see what's going on. Uh, then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. Ah, not Peter. Isn't this typical of Peter? <laughs> he, he's going to say whatever he wants to say, and now he just charges into the tomb. <laughs> he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in. And he saw and believed. For as yet, they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. Which I find a little bit... All out of these work. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. The tomb's empty. Let's go home. It's just about lunchtime. And their dad's married. <laughs> <laughs> and Mary's gone... Well, hello. <laughs> What's, yeah, I, I don't. That's the only gospel that says that the disciples went back to their homes. I, I, I don't know why. Maybe John's feeling bad, and he's, this is confession time. I don't know, um, but it is kind of strange. If you know that your Lord has been laid in this tomb, and the tomb has been sealed with this rock, nobody's going to move it. And now you come back and the tomb is empty. Then you go home? I don't know. I, I think I would have been trying to find out. I'd gone to the other disciples and said, hey, there's something strange going on here. At the very least, right? Okay. Uh, but, uh, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. <laughs> you know, you got to chuckle a little bit. I mean, this is a grand and glorious day. I mean, it's the, the best day in our lives without, without Easter. There is no Christmas. Without Easter, nothing else matters. So this is a a, a marvelous day. This is why we Christians get all 
all worked up and celebrative and and uh, all of that and we drag out our, our Easter eggs and our chocolate candy and you know we, we do it upright and our, our clothes and you know I just go mm, okay uh, and, and give a homage to the Easter button you know <laughs> drives me crazy well anyway okay question what conclusion did Mary jump to when she went to the tomb early on Easter morning? That the body had been uh, either stolen or Gardner, you've taken him. Where did where did you lay him? I mean, she's not thinking that. Well, that doesn't make any sense. That this thing was sealed. And it doesn't make any sense that a gardener, one man, would have rolled that away and taken the body out and, and put it someplace else. But she's not thinking uh, clearly. Understandable. She's gone through three days, uh, three days of hell, really. Wow. Friday, Saturday. Uh. But, but, and I do understand this. I have always wondered about it. She. She knew how she um, how she conceived that baby. Different Mary. What? Different Mary. Well, this is this not is Mary Magdalene. Oh, this that's is not Mary the mother. That. Yeah, Just, I know. There's too many Marys. Mary <laughs> this is Mary Magdalene. Because why did not Jesus' mother? Um, understand all that was going on. She raised that kid, you know. Um, she listened to him do his preaching. Why didn't that stick? Why didn't she have that faith to you know what he was about? What suggests that she didn't? She only, was at the foot of the cross. Yeah, only that I confused the two Marys. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Ma Mary Magdalene was confused. Mary, the Mother Mary, was not, not confused. She knew what her son was going to go through. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's, there's Mary, the mother of Jesus. There's Mary Magdalene. There's Mary, the wife of Clopas. You know, it's just like, uh, you know, Mary was a popular name, I guess. You know, and so a lot of people were named Mary. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so she's a little, Mary Magdalene is is confused. I probably should have put that in there instead of just Mary. Number two, what convinced Peter and John, who often does not refer to himself by name, that Jesus had risen? <clears throat> what do you think? Tomb's empty. John looks in. He sees it's empty. Peter runs in. Yep, definitely empty. John comes in. Yep, empty. What convinced them? Other than the empty tomb. Mm -hmm. I think the burial clothes. The, yeah. Referring or reflecting on the prophecy, certainly. Mm -hmm. The burial clothes. Mm -hmm. They're not they're they're folded up. You know, if somebody's gonna rob the grave, they're not gonna care about the burial clothes. But here the the uh, clothes are folded up nicely. Yeah, it sounded like there were two. Two what? Burial clothes. Yeah, one, one for the, the head body and, and one, one for the head. So when they talk about the shroud of Turin, is that just the one over the face? If it's even legit. Yeah, yeah. I think it, I think it's um, it's the body from, uh, but it's the image of of it's Christ, right. so it must have been over the face too. Do you uh, think that's the legitimate? Did they find it? Well, I think it's possible, but there's too many there's too many relics out there that that people tend to hold. You know, I was told when I was a kid that under every um, altar in a Roman Catholic church there was a piece of the cross, the original cross. That had to be the hugest cross in the world. 
I mean, there's too many Catholic churches for one. And I, I don't know, but I was told that. And, uh, and I don't know if they still, you know, adhere to that or not. Uh, the Shroud of Turin, um, I, I personally don't need it to prove anything to me. It would be interesting if it is true. Then you, you know, and I think, I think we Christians so desperately want to have something to hold on to, and I think that's the dangerous part. Because you and I believe by faith. That Jesus died and rose again. They want to see the physical. They want to see some physical evidence, and that's where I think the Shroud of Turin, you know, gets. It's like uh, these different uh, places uh, where you get the weeping statue of Mary and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, if it is, it is. But it doesn't matter to me. I still believe. So, all right. Uh, number three, Jesus sent Mary's fears away with a single word. When Mary saw Jesus, she stopped asking questions and clung to him dearly. What message was Mary to give to the disciples? Yeah. What's the message? going on to his father and their father to my God and their God. Uh, there's the, the uh, Mary. Uh, she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Laboni, teacher. She, she had to recognize the voice, I think. Ah. This is, this is Jesus. And then, of course, what does she want to do? She's going to hug him. Yeah. Hey. Oh, I'm so excited. I'm so thrilled. That you're, you're, you truly are alive. And, da, 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 da. and he says, uh, don't cling to me. Because <laughs> I'm not sticking around. Things he's, he's going to be leaving again. If you cling to the physical presence of Jesus, that's going to cause you problems later on. It's kind of like back to the trial of Turin. If you're going to cling to that as proof, you know, what happens if somebody destroys that trial? Or, or through all the tests they can do today, they discover it's not real. Oh, well, wait a minute, that's not real, then my faith's not real, and then what do I believe in? And, you know, and this, is, this is where we keep saying it's the Word of God that teaches us, and, that bring, and it's the Holy Spirit that brings us to faith. So I believe whether, um, you know, whether I have physical proof or not, it's like uh, I, I was doing a, a Bible study with some men in the Gospel of Matthew uh, the other night. We were talking about uh, when Jesus is going to return and how some of these churches and some of these um, uh, soothsayers out there say, yeah, get yourself ready because he's coming in this year. And I, I told the guys about a uh, track or a little booklet I got back in 1988. 88 reasons why the rapture is going to happen in 1988. Hmm, I thought, well, that's curious. I think I threw it away. Next year, I got another one that said 89 reasons why the rapture is going to happen in 1989. Uh, you know, you get people all worked up. They tell them to sell everything, you know. Well, then when it doesn't happen, they're stuck. And they're hurting and they're doubting. You and I, we believe what the Word says. And that's the problem that uh, Tom, we're going to see Thomas having too. Who 
Moving on, verse 19. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Who are the Jews? These are the chief priests, the elders of the people. It's not just your average Jew. It's the leaders. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. All right. And the computer did a number on me. Took out of space. Question one. The disciples had quite a day. Reports came flooding in from Mary, the other women, Peter and John, and the two disciples who were on their way to Emmaus. The climax of the day came when Jesus appeared to them. He said, Peace be with you. Contrast this with what Jesus could have said. What could he have said? What would you and I have said? Let's put it that way. He says, Peace be with you. You can't imagine what I've been through. You can't imagine the last three days of my life. And where were you guys? I mean, you look at the disciples, they all took off. And I told you, and I told you. I told you, and I told you, and I told you. Sounds like something we said to our kids, right? I told you and told you this was going to happen, but you don't listen. And Jesus could have said that. He did not. Because he's all about grace and mercy and love and peace. Peace be with you. He knew what his disciples had gone through. They were upset. They were, you know, behind locked doors for fear of the Jews. So he knew they were you know, stressed. So, wasn't it a beautiful thing to say, peace be with you. Ah. Consider, and I haven't done this, but consider how many times peace is said in our worship services. You know, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Peace of the Lord be with you. Pastor Hens, uh, Go in peace. You know, those kind of things. Sprinkled throughout the, the, the worship service, frequently is the word peace. Hmm. Because, I think, I had no plan in, in establishing the liturgy, but I think those who did knew how much we as desperate human beings need peace. Conflicts, I've never since I have any. Absolutely. It's only getting worse. And it gets worse. Aren't you glad you don't live, live in East Palestine, Ohio? Mm -hmm. I, 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 
feel so badly for those folks. And so they're, they're under tremendous stress. I don't even want to bathe my children because of the water. Well, drink bottled water. Well, okay, fine. I can't afford to buy bottled water all the time, though. You know, I don't know what. It's a, it's a blue-collar town, I think, and, and it's not a, a high-income community as far as I know. You know, so they're under such tremendous stress. Or if you lived in Ukraine, Oh my goodness, every single day. They don't know if a bomb's going to hit them. You know, so. Syria. Syria. Turkey. 41, Turkey. 41,000? Uh, 45,000 now? Uh, yeah. But another one was sick. Yeah. I've. I saw them somewhere on TV, after 12 days or 13 days, they're still saving people, isn't it? I think that's incredible. A miracle. Because they first said three days was going to be it before they... Before yeah. they could yeah. find survivors. And, and here they're, mm, boy, oh boy, oh boy. Yeah. But imagine the stress in those, those countries. And then Syria is having its issues, and, uh, and our, I guess our guys went over and, and took out an ISIS leader, but you know other parts of that uh, that uh, country are, are are under stress. You know, oftentimes the people we don't want any part of this. It's all these knuckleheads going. On. It's kind of like we feel sometimes about our government. I don't want any part of that. I just want to live my life. And whatever goes on in Washington, yeah, yeah, or in St. Paul, I guess. I don't want that snow that's coming. <laughs> or that snow that's coming. I tell you what, Florida sounds awful. Kept <laughs> 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 I should have left last November. We should have got out of Dodge. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well. Then. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> We'll see. <coughs> All right. Um, where was it? Question two. Jesus gave the disciples and the church as a whole a tremendous right and responsibility. What was it? We Lutherans call it the office of the keys. You learn this in confirmation class out of your catechism. See, I'm, I'm being that. You should have learned this in your confirmation class. The ability to forgive sins or the, retain sins. To, the ability to forgive sins or to withhold that forgiveness given to the disciples and the church. Capital C on church. Well, we have the responsibility to forgive sins of those who confess and repent. No, we can't say, nah, I don't think you're really that sincere. So I'm going to withhold for you. No, you don't have that right. One of the uh, most beautiful parts of the, of the liturgy for me now sitting on this side of the pew is confession and absolution. To have the pastor absolve me of my many sins. That's just, that's just precious stuff. And, and we dare not take that for granted. That, well, let's get through this part of the liturgy so we can move on kind of thing. This is um, divinely granted, and yet here, Pastor, when he says it, uh, as a called and ordained servant of the Lord, and by, in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ. That's the way we used to learn it. Now they've changed some of the words and I, I get confused. Uh, I forgive you all your sins. Oh. He's doing it in the place of Jesus. He's standing there for Jesus and he is forgiving each one of us our sins. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. <coughs> uh, although I get I get uh, parts of the, of the liturgy I struggle with because I've learned it so long ago, and 
every Sunday. Uh, I was thinking about that with the communion liturgy today. <laughs> the Lord be with you and also with you. Uh, give thanks to the Lord. We used to say, it is meet and right so to do. Now I don't know what we say. <laughs> but I thought of that today. Because that's why I have to look at the screen. I can't depend on, on my memory. And that's not a fault of the liturgy. I'm not complaining. I'm just going, what happened to meet and write? <laughs> well, that's going by the way. So that's over English. Younger people don't understand. Well, true, I don't know that we understood it either, but you know, that was part of the way it was. And but I think it's that's not a bad thing that we have it printed in the bulletin or it's it's on the screens. Because then I think about it. That's the danger of the Lord's Prayer. Not to follow the prayer. It's I know that prayer so well. It's wrote. It's wrote. Mm -hmm. And you just <clears throat> whip it out and you know, I used to tell my confirmation class. Don't just memorize it and recite it. You look at it and read it. And we would always print the Lord's Prayer because I wanted them in church to see it. And not whether they did or not. Oh, I'm sure they did if I said so. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so number three, how did Jesus deal with Doubting Thomas? I, uh, uh, Doubting Thomas. He appeared, even though the door was closed, he appeared and told him to put his hands into the... Yeah. Check it out, Thomas. Here it is. You had doubts? Here, put your hands on my side. I always thought that the first sermon I ever preached before I ever went to the seminary was a was Easter uh, Sunday after Easter, and the gospel for that Sunday is always, or usually, depending on the, the lesson, John 20, 19, 31, it's Downing Thomas. And so I was I was teaching in a school in Florida. <laughs> where it was warm and all that. Uh, and the pastor was going to be out of town in a small church, and he asked if, if I would, since I was going to the seminary. They always thought, since you're going, well, I didn't know anything. <laughs> I was, yes, I'm going. Um, if I lead the service and preach a sermon. And, uh, yeah, but I didn't know how to preach a sermon. I didn't. But I got, I got this gospel, and I always, I've always liked Thomas. Because I think Thomas said what the other guys were thinking. And we give him the poor guy doubting Thomas. We can't just call him Thomas. He's doubting Thomas. We're all doubting. And we're all. Yeah, you, know, you could say doubting Peter, doubting, you know, doubting John, doubting Matthew, whatever. Uh, but that poor old Thomas. And he, he speaks up and says, how could this be? Just... Help me understand this. And Jesus did. He helped him understand. How can people forgive sins? Isn't God the only one who can forgive sins? Well, what do you say to that? Receive the Holy Spirit, and if you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. And if you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. Jesus offers that that responsibility, and, and, and yeah, that, that uh, the petition in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses. They should stop there. Yeah. You know, Let's move on. As we forgive the soul. So Lord, if I'm not forgiving others, don't you forgive me. That's what it, that's the meaning. Well, wait, no, I don't 
I want forgiveness. So, and, and Jesus gives them that. Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. I don't know, you know, if you forgive the sins of any. It's, it's kind of like, uh, yeah, because I know how you, you are going to be. Sometimes you're not going to be very forgiving. You ever run into somebody who doesn't want to forgive you? You know, and, and that person is a Christian. And you go, well, wait a minute. I had a, a lady who was, this was many years ago, in another church. She got upset with me. She wanted me to, to visit a, a, her daughter in the hospital who just had a baby. I didn't know her daughter from Adam. She wasn't a member of the congregation, but I should go up to the cities when we lived out of way. And I didn't make it. And I, you know, and uh, she came through the church and she was, she was not happy. And she was grumpy, kind of her life anyway. <laughs> And, and I, thought, I said to her, I, I am sorry, I apologize, do I have your forgiveness? Well, of course you do. <laughs> and she went, started out going, gee, it didn't feel like I did. <laughs> After we left that congregation, we went back for a visit, you would have thought we were best friends. I'm going, hmm, okay. I, I don't ask questions. If anybody wants to to be forgiving to me, that's that's just great. I like the last uh, last two verses of this chapter. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing. You may have life in his name. You know, Jesus did a bunch of other stuff. And we're going to see in, in chapter 21, John's going to say, he did so many things that uh, all the books of the world couldn't contain everything he did. Okay. These are written so that you may believe. I, I just love that John, John has no, um, you know, he's not writing a bestseller. He's not going to send his gospel to Simon Schuster and, you know, say, uh, print out uh, a million copies. I want to make some money off this. John wants to share the gospel of Jesus with people. And so that's, that's what it's written for. So that you may believe. Simple. Simple. Okay. In this, in this Bible, it comes to, before those verses, it says the purpose of this book. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a good... Uh, I'm wondering... Says that, in, yeah, it says that in my book, in my book too. Uh, so here, summed up in in, in the, uh, the the whole thing is here's here's why this book is written. This is the purpose. All right, John chapter twenty one. Jesus appears to his disciples in Galilee. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. That's the Sea of Galilee. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, It is the Lord. And Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord. He put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. Notice the other disciples. Peter dives overboard. He doesn't have to carry the fish in. Um, anyway. 
when they verse 9 when they got out on land they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread Jesus said to them bring some of the fish that you have just caught so Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish 153 of them and although there were so many the net was not torn Jesus said to them come and have breakfast now none of the disciples dared ask him who are you they knew it was the Lord Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? He said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This, he said, to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, Follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following him, the one who also had leaned back against him during the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, If it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things who has written these things. We know that his testimony is true. Now there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. There you go. John chapter 21. Question 1. Peter's desire to go fishing set up the miracle Jesus was about to perform. How did they do that? Well, if they hadn't been fishing, there would have been no need for a, uh, a miracle. The disciples were in a helpless position. They had they fished all night and caught nothing. And now this, uh, you know, uh, it sets up Jesus to perform the miracle. Let down your nets on the other side. I, I find that intriguing. These were seasoned fishermen. They don't know who this guy is. They haven't recognized him yet. And so they put it down. I guess they're thinking, what's the harm? Let's try it. What do we got to lose? Why do you suppose Peter jumped into the water to get to Jesus so quickly? personality, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of think so. This is Peter who, who loves the Lord and he, he wants to get there and see Jesus. When he finds out it's Jesus, I, I, I like the way it, the Bible puts it, he threw himself into the sea. Mm -hmm. right? That's a different way than what, you know, he dove into the water is the way we'd say it today. But it's the same concept. Peter had said that even if the other disciples fell away from Jesus, he would not. His love was greater than that of his fellow disciples. How did Jesus use this statement of Peter's as he spoke with him? And how did Jesus use the fact that Peter had denied him three times? Lord, all the rest of these guys may uh, abandon you, but not me. That's how much I love you. 
What does Jesus say? Peter? Yeah, he told him that he may love him, but he wasn't going to hold true to that. He was going hmm. to do something wrong. But how does how does he challenge him in this scenario? By telling him what he was going to do wrong? Well, no, by asking him, do you love me? And how many times does he do that? Three times. Three times. How many times did Peter deny him? Three times. This is kind of Jesus' way of, of bringing him back into the fold. Peter, you denied me three times. You have now confessed your love for me three times. We're all good. I want you to feed my sheep, to feed my lambs, to tend my sheep. I want you, Peter. So Peter had to feel good about that. Uh, question four, Jesus prepared Peter for martyrdom. Peter objected as he had done before. In fact, he was jealous of John. Why? Did Jesus really say that John would not die? Peter's jealous uh, because John comes along with him. He's following Jesus. And Jesus you know, welcomes him. And Peter, you know, he wants Jesus all to himself. Right? And so, did Jesus really say that John would not die? Well, no. No. <laughs> he, he, uh, he just... If, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You know, it's kind of like, uh, Peter, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought. Uh, you have, uh, you're blessed. I've forgiven you. I, I want you to be uh, my disciple. But I want John too. He can follow me too. And, and John, in, in his ending, tells uh, is a, a witness about how Peter was going to die. Church tradition says that Peter was crucified upside down because he didn't feel he could uh, be crucified in the same way that his Lord had been crucified. You know, Peter, he, he got it together. I, I think that's the good news. Peter got it together. After Pentecost, these guys kind of straightened out their lives. And they went out, and they boldly proclaimed Christ, and they boldly died in faith. You, you read all the church traditions of how the disciples died. There are gruesome deaths. Except for John. We, we think John died in exile on the island of Patmos as an older man. I don't know how old, but some say he was in his 90s, which would have been really unusual in those days to live that long. Just, that couldn't have happened, pardon me. So. Memory verse, uh, you know, just in case you want something to do this week. Actually, memory verses. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's you and me. We have not seen Jesus physically, but we believe. And then... In John 20, 31 did. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. And that's what we have. Life in His name. No matter what we go through in this life, we have eternal life in Christ Jesus. That's the good news. Thoughts, comments, questions? You can see the cave yet in Patmos. I'm sorry, you can, you see, can see the cave. Oh, can you? Where John was um, in, you know, incarcerated, I guess. You can see where he supposedly laid the book when he was writing it. Um, supposedly, yeah. Yeah, um, I was there about um, 15 years ago. Oh, okay. And, um, it's not as touristic as so many places are. 
um, it's very quiet there and hardly visible. Yeah. I was surprised. Interesting. It was there getting off the cruise ship and uh, very few went. Yeah. It was, yeah. It was yeah. awesome. Oh, that's neat. Yeah, that's neat. Uh, we were in Israel a number of years ago and, and we went by the, the tomb of Lazarus. And across the street from the tomb of Lazarus was a, a souvenir shop. <laughs> you know, yeah. Just leaves a little bit. So that's nice to hear. That there wasn't 15 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you should probably take another cruise and go back and find <laughs> out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. Yeah, where would the Isle of Patmos be off of what? Oh, it's it's off of... Um, One of the Greek Isles. Yeah. Oh, okay. Not too far from... Um, Mykonos and uh, Matthew Martin, Zandarini. Okay. Some of those. Yeah. Yeah, that is in the Mediterranean Sea. That, okay. Or Rhodes is pretty close. Rhodes? Yeah, and the Rhodes is not too far. So the, the ship take uh, take you to all those? Usually, it does about two or two of those on cruise. Yeah, okay. Hmm. Hmm. Is it warm there? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of olives. See, everywhere I go, it's cold, so I don't know. Well, we should uh, close our time up, and and I don't know if Pastor is done, but that's okay. Let's, let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this gospel, this precious gospel that you have given to us. One that we can read, learn, and inwardly digest. One that we have with us each and every day. That reminds us that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that by believing in him, we have life in him. So Lord, give us that comfort. Give us that peace as we uh, travel through these uh, treacherous days, these stressful days. Remind us that we are in your hands. We belong to you. And nothing will pluck us out of those hands. So go with us now, we pray. As we go our ways, that we might live our lives this week praising you, celebrating who you are. It's in Jesus' precious name we pray.